Now let's look at progestins and antiprogestins. We know that the naturally occurring progestin is progesterone, which is secreted by the corpus luteum of the ovary in the beginning of pregnancy or also in the second half of the menstrual cycle to maintain the endometrial layer while it is also secreted from the placenta during the later stages of pregnancy. How it acts is by progesterone receptors, the density of which is controlled by estrogen itself. Let's see some actions of progesterone first. It maintains the pregnancy by maintaining the uterine endometrial layer. It also acts in the secretory phase of the menstrual cycle by maturing and proliferating endometrial glands. It decreases fallopian tube motility and decreases uterine contractions, thus promoting uh, pregnancy. It is hostile to sperm penetration and causes the cervical mucus to become thick, viscous and acidic. It stimulates SNS prol proliferation in the breast and prepares the mother for milk secretion. It can also cause hyperglycemia, diabetic-like uh, condition on long-term use. It increases LDL, which is good for the developing fetus because it is making cell membranes. It favors fat deposition by increasing lipoprotein lipase activity. It also has mineralocorticoid activity and thus edema. It increases the temperature of the body and also inhibits synthesis of estrogen receptors. Progesterone, in contrast to estrogen, has negative feedback both on the hypothalamus and pituitary, thus decreases FSH and LH secretion and inhibits ovulation. Let's see some uses of progestins. Firstly, they are used in contraception, all sorts of methods, in combination with estrogen and even alone. In combination with estrogen, it will inhibit some unwanted effects of estrogen, such as breast cancer, endometrial cancer, etc. While how it acts as a contraceptive is by producing a thick mucus plug and preventing sperm entry by inhibiting FSH, so no follicle growth, and inhibiting LH, so no ovulation. Dysfunctional uterine bleeding occurs due to irregular breakdown of an overgrown endometrium, so progesterone can be used to prevent the overgrowth of the endometrium. It is given as an initial dose to arrest the bleeding, and then a maintenance dose is given for 20 days. Then withdrawal bleed will occur when it is stopped for 2 to 5 days and then the cyclic therapy is continued for 3 to 6 months. Progesterone also finds its use in endometriosis which is a painful condition in which abnormal endometrium grows outside of the uterus. Now how progesterone can be used is by inhibiting ovulation and inducing anovulatory cycles. We know that as long as there is progesterone there is no ovulation. So if there is no ovulation, there is no estrogen-dependent proliferation of the endometrium. Progesterone is also used in hormone replacement therapy in association with estrogen to antagonize some side effects of uh, estrogen such as endometrial proliferation. And for the same reason, it can be used in endometrial carcinoma. Also, it can be used to postpone the menstrual bleeding because as we know that it maintains the endometrial layer so it can be used either alone or with estrogen three days before the expected menstruation and withdrawal bleed will occur within 72 hours after stoppage of the progesterone. The adverse effects include acne, fluid retention, weight gain, depression, irregular cycles, hirsutism, hyperglycemia, increased risk of breast cancer, on prolonged use because new studies now suggest that progesterone is the main culprit behind breast cancer and not estrogen. I'm not very sure. The older medicines used to increase LDL and cause um, coronary diseases while the new ones do not cause this. Now that we know what progesterone does and what it's used for, let's see some preparations that are used for these purposes. The preparations can include natural progestin, that is progesterone, but it is not very effective orally because of extensive first pass metabolism. It can be given by IM root in oil base, but mostly synthetics are preferred. The synthetics are progesterone derivatives or non-testosterone derivatives. Now to remember them or to identify them, I should say, all of them have just in their 
names except norethindrone that you have to remember. The synthetic progesterone derivatives include medroxyprogesterone acetate, hydroxyprogesterone caproate, and magestrol acetate. The non nor testosterone derivatives include norethindrone, norgestril, levonogestril, desogestril, gestodine, and norgestimate. Finally, let's see antiprogestins. Antiprogestins are competitive antagonists of progestins. They have luteolytic property, that is, they destroy the corpus luteum. They have anti-glucocorticoid properties and anti-androgenic properties as well. The chief antiprogestin and the only drug you need to remember is mifepristone. It undergoes enterohepatic circulation as well. This drug will be used where we want to antagonize the effects of progesterone. For example, it can be used in abortion because we know progesterone is responsible for maintaining the pregnancy. It can also be used in contraception because uh, as progesterone maintains the secretory layer of the endometrium, it will cause the sloughing and shedding of the layer. And as we've seen previously that progesterone decreases uterine contractility, it will do the opposite and increase the contractility and can be used in induction of labor in cases of intrauterine deaths. The side effects include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, headache, bleeding uh, because it is anti-progesterone and as progesterone maintains the endometrial layer it will cause it to slough off and also teratogenicity.